I guess I just want to start off with this quote from Jude that we all know very well, because like Jude, we would much rather talk of positive things, but unfortunately we have to deal with these issues that come up. And you notice what Jude says to us is that he wants to get us to have a vigorous defence of the faith once for all delivered to God's people. And that particular statement from Jude there is, is very important because it tells us that the faith was delivered once and for all time. It's not an evolving thing. Truth does not need to evolve. And so when the scriptures were finished, we had everything necessary for us to understand the will and the purpose of God with the earth. The scriptures are very clear, aren't they, about the need to rightly handle the word of truth. And it's really unfortunate that we find in this debate with the theistic evolutionists that there is this unfortunate mishandling of the, the word of truth that takes place. And it's not a new problem. Error has always been with us. You go back to the first century, there were people like Hymenius and Philetus who were preaching incorrect views about the resurrection. and Though the issues might change, the problem of mishandling the word of truth is always going to be with us. The results, unfortunately, are the same. And, and with this theistic evolution, which has been pretty well open with us now for about 10 years in the Brotherhood, some have left. And in Australia here, I can say that some have become atheists. Um, others have gone and, and now find themselves quite comfortable um, in the churches and actually can accommodate the Trinity and other things like that. And it just shows you that the path that often uh, is followed by people to go down this path is to go right out of the faith. And that's what was happening in the first century, and it can certainly happen again. What we're dealing with is what is called now God-directed evolution. And there is a debate in the Brotherhood as to whether or not this can be accommodated. And this is where very much in Australia we're debating this particular issue. Is this an essential doctrine or not? What are we talking about when we say God-directed evolution? Well, it's believing that God created. They believe in God. They believe in all the promises that we have. They believe in the kingdom. But when it comes to the actual source of life upon the earth, they believe that God used an evolutionary process. And we believe that this, this new understanding that is being promoted about the sources of life and, and how the world was created actually presents a, a very big challenge to the BASF. And in Australia, we have a thing called the Cooper Carter Addendum, which um, reflected the work of unity in Australia through the agency of Brother Cooper and Brother Carter in 1958. And that's part of our fellowship basis in Australia. But it's completely in harmony with the BASF. It just explains clauses 5 and 12 in greater detail. But we find that when we come to God-directed evolution, it actually starts to come right across the fundamentals of our faith expressed in these documents that we have always used. It is a sad fact, and it's very true, that people with the beliefs in theistic evolution are not always challenged in ecclesias, and some ecclesias believe this is a matter of uncertain detail, and therefore they make no issue with it. So that presents a problem when it comes to inter-ecclesial arrangements. So I want to just go over a few verses about why Bible truth is important. When you go to Colossians 1, verse 5 and 6, Paul writing to what he calls the Adelphos in Christos, or the Christadelphians, as it says in verse 2, Paul says, this is how you came to be in this select group of Christadelphians. It's because you heard the word of truth in the gospel. And again, he repeats it in verse 6, since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God, in truth. And there's a tremendous focus in Paul's writings about the necessity for truth. When we come to the, the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 18, James defines for us what makes us one of the saints, one of the sanctified ones, one of the first fruits unto the Lamb. And it is the fact that we have the, received the word of truth. We have been begotten by the word of truth. And so truth is the defining thing that makes us the people of God, the bride of Christ, those that God is working with in the world today. And it's not arrogance to say that, but it is the uniqueness of the gospel we need to be very much thankful for. Not because in any way we deserve it more than anybody else, but by the grace of God we have received that word of truth that makes us to be part of the first fruits unto our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why true doctrine really matters. 
When you go to Galatians chapter 1, you find Paul dealing, dealing with the problem probably of Judaism. But whatever it was, it was a twisting of the gospel of Christ. It was what he called another gospel. They weren't suddenly believing in spacemen or trin the Trinity or something as, as radical as that. It was something that happened to the, the original gospel to twist it out of shape. And so we find that that is something that is very much condemned in the writings of the apostle. So we cannot allow the truth to be twisted out of shape. And that's pretty well where theistic evolution takes us. And we'll see why in a moment. I want to just also quote the second of Peter, chapter 3, verse 16 to 18. And this is reading from the ESV. Count the patience of our Lord of salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. In other words, Paul's wisdom comes from God, as he does in all his letters whether, where he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Now, again, we have this concept that it's possible to take the writings of the scripture and to twist them out of shape. But Peter makes it clear that that can lead to destruction. That can lead to being carried away with the error of the lawless people. But he also says that Paul is equated to Scripture. He says there, there are other Scriptures they also twist, as well as the Scriptures that Paul wrote. And that's important because you will find when you discuss with theistic evolutionists that they downgrade the writings of Paul to opinion. And, and it's very much um, something that we have to be aware of, that Paul is actually speaking the Scriptures. So the warning is there. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. And it is sad, as I said, that some have been carried away with that particular problem into atheism and even worse to the church. So what is the evolution? Well, this evolution is what they call it. It's actually something that's been around for many, many years. Uh, particularly evident in the churches. In fact, um, even the Pope is now preaching theistic evolution of a kind. The Jehovah Witnesses have uh, dropped their creationism and now actually preach theistic evolution. So this is a very much a strong trend which is coming at us from many, many directions. Theistic evolution believes that God created the world over many billions of years, but did it using a gradual evolutionary process. It actually adopts the Darwinian model of upper progression of a species, survival of the fittest, and things like that, mutations. But it takes out the element of chance. So what they say is that God must have built into the creation, the first creation that he started off, the, 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 the ability for it to upwardly change species. Or, as we'll see later on, they also suggest that when God wanted to upgrade the, the creation, he intervened in the process directly by miracle. And that's, a, that's really the fundamental difference between what we believe is that God created in an instant by the word of his power as against this totally unsupported assumption that they have adopted, that God built in genetic improvement and then also kicked it along at times, as they say. And the reason they do this is that they want to actually have a Darwinian model, but also keep God in the process. So they actually get rid of the blind chance and the lack of purpose that the Darwinian model has, which just says that the world just happened to be by pure chance for no reason, that out of nothing came everything. Um, they take that away and say there is a reason. It's the same reason that you and I believe in that God created for a purpose, but the methodology is to actually adopt the Darwinian model. And so we, they call themselves in Australia evolutionary creationists, and their theory is God-directed evolution. So that's what we're dealing with in the Brotherhood today. Interestingly, Darwin had absolutely no time for the idea of theistic evolution because he thought that God had to be totally excluded. And Charles Darwin said this, I would give absolutely nothing for a theory of natural selection if it required miraculous intervention at any one stage of descent. So fascinating that they want to align with Darwin. Darwin's not interested in aligning with them. Richard Dawkins, I'm sure you know who Richard Dawkins is, the, the noted atheist skeptic. Um, he said this in his book, The Blind Watchmaker. For Darwin, any evolution that had to be helped over the jumps by God was not evolution at all. 
And that would be the, the general opinion of most atheists and most skeptics. Um, they're not interested in theistic evolution at all as a possibility. And the, the irony is that we have brethren who are trying to align themselves with, with, with so-called science, but in the process actually find themselves even more alienated from science because once you introduce God, you find yourself against the institutions who will not let God get one foot in the door, as one quotation said. They want nothing to do with anything divine. So it's, it's an anomaly, isn't it, that we have brethren who are trying to align with the science, uh, and yet the science wants nothing to do with God. So where the, where the debate is happening, well, it's happening very much on the internet forums, it's on Facebook, it's on the Watchman sites, it's on the Berea portal, and many other websites and, and blogs where you can actually go in and there is a fast and furious debate that can happen. And what I was really surprised to find was how many people are contributing to it and watching the debate. Um, it actually, in, in my experience at the time, it was particularly in, in perhaps the five, six hundreds who were actually listening and, and being involved in this debate. We now find, though, that some brethren have found platforms where they can actually get and speak this publicly in our community. And, and that's a very sad development, but it's now happening in a number of places. I want to just mention John Walton because John Walton is what they call a pseudo and evangelist. And um, there is information available on John Walton and his writings if you want to find, look for it. But he is a, a very, very clever evangelist who uses the Bible in a very, very interesting way um, to support theistic evolution arguments, to actually support a whole lot of areas in challenging the standard interpretation of the Bible. And we are now finding in Australia that some of the brethren who speak on theistic evolution are quoting John Walton verbatim in their talks. And his writing is incredibly dangerous. So just be aware of John Walton. If you hear that name, then have a very close look at anything that is said. Another sad fact is that we have seen in Australia, and I can only speak from our experience here, but we had some brethren who set out to try and argue the science and, and finding themselves floundering in doing so have been convinced to become theistic evolutionists. And I'll talk more about that particular problem in a moment. Why has this debate come up and resurfaced in the last 10 years? Well, technology is the main cause, that there is tremendous connection now between people all over the world, and, and people who have or want to introduce new ideas now have a, a platform that they never had before, and that is that they can get on the internet and they can spread their ideas as much as they like. We are faced with a tremendous pressure from the, the academic world to accept the conclusions of science, and it's a very sad fact that science is projected to us as, as proven fact in the area of, of origins, and when in fact it's anything but proven fact. The younger generations have been taught by the, the, the modernist world that, that to have a strong respect for science, and they're internet savvy, and so they go looking for information in ways perhaps the older generation don't do. Another problem we're finding is that there are not many older brethren that are capable of dealing with the volume and the speed of the technology-based arguments. When you get involved in these chat rooms and debate portals, the, the debate is fast and furious, and, and regularly you might spend an evening answering someone's post, and then by the time you get up in the morning, there's another 200 pages of stuff to wade through because they are very good at diligging you with information uh, and particularly scientific papers. And it's very hard for the older generation to actually cope with this. And so we need our younger brethren to, to be able to actually take the right position on these matters. We're dealing with the current worldview, postmodernism, which promotes that history needs to be reinterpreted. And so, again, it's very fashionable to, to look at Bible uh, statements and to try and reinterpret them according to the, the modern way of thinking. I can also say from personal experience that a number of these people are people who perhaps weren't very well known, but have now found an area of expertise by, by pushing scientific documents around that they appear to be the experts and authorities on these matters. And when it comes to the defining of the, of the Bible according to science, then they, of course, are the ones who become the authorities on how to do that. And, and it's, it's quite sad that this is happening in our midst. So just summarising some of the things that theistic evolution does believe, 
they believe that God created the world by starting off evolution, that God seeded the world by introducing DNA and life cells designed to evolve gradually. So this is the assumption that in the beginning, whatever creatures God made first, whatever forms of life God made first, um, then there was involved in those those creations something that would automatically progress upward. Then they say in their own words um, that God kicked it along at times. So then God, after perhaps after a couple of billion years, decided that fish needed to walk on land, so he actually then kicked it along so the fish started crawling on the land. And, and you know, they, they've got absolutely no proof for this at all, but they have to try and match the Darwinian model, and so they have to make these kinds of assumptions. The six days of creation, well, they will quote you that it could mean anything of 15 different varieties. Um, certainly most of them believe they were incredibly long time periods of many billions of years. Um, they might have been the fiats or the times of revelation that were given to Moses. Uh, anything but six literal days. They definitely don't agree with the 7,000 year plan because when you have 14 billion years, it doesn't quite fit. They believe that there was on the earth before Adam evolved man-like creatures called hominids um, who formed nations outside the Middle East long before Adam was created. So there were, they said, cities and nations in existence long before Adam came along. Um, most theistic evolutionists would tell you that some form of human being existed for 150 million years before Adam. They believe that when Cain was exiled, he left Eden and married into the hominid races, and, and there are plenty of explanations in the Brotherhood about who Cain actually married. Um, there is no evidence he married into the hominid races. Hominids survive a local flood. Very essential if you're a theistic evolutionist to believe in a local flood, because if you believe in a worldwide flood, then of course all the dating theories of Darwinian evolution become very suspect. So they do. Uh, believe in very much in a local flood in Noah's time, just something in the Middle East region. They believe Adam was created mortal, and here's where we start to conflict with the BASF and other documents of the Brotherhood. They believe that he was mortal and he was not changed physically. They also believe he was prone to sin before he actually transgressed. So we have a number of areas of conflict come up when it comes to Adam and the Atonement. I'm going to quote from Brother Jonathan Burke and Brother Jonathan Polkson, who have published their writings very widely. And uh, as you'll see later on, Brother Jonathan Burke actually challenges us to, to, to quote him. So a number of other people I will not mention by name because they haven't given me permission to do so. But Brother Jonathan Burke, who's in Taiwan, said this, We used to seeing the divine hand at work in human history as evidenced by the improbable survival of Israel. And of course, we do agree totally with that statement, but we don't agree with the next application of that statement. Likewise, we can see a divine hand at work in natural history evolution, intervening at key times to nudge evolution in the right direction. There again is that assumption which they base is that God was involved in nudging it along or kicking it along in the right direction at various points. And you can understand why they would then say that we shouldn't obsess over the mechanics of this, because they know this is a very vulnerable area of their argument, that they have no proof, they have no Bible statement that says anything like that, that God nudged evolution along in the right direction. But that's the, the, the basis they must accept if they're going to match God and Darwin together. Another one of them says this, it seems that our interpretation of Genesis is the problem, not science. And we'll come to that more in a moment. You should be wary of accepting any scriptural statements about the natural world as literally true, even though believed to be so for many generations. And they will quote to you that many people who read the Bible believe that the, the sun revolved around the earth. They believe that the earth was built upon pillars because they overread the Bible into natural phenomena. So how do we answer that challenge? Well, the Bible is always right, despite the fact that men have misread it. The Bible doesn't pretend to be a science manual, but it's never been proved wrong because it was written by the hand of God. No doubt in the past, men have interpreted the Bible incorrectly. You know, we talk about the rising of the sun. In fact, you can read that in the Psalms about the rising of the sun. When we know now that it's actually the earth revolving on its axis, 
where the sun appears and disappears with the cycles of the day. So was the Bible wrong? No, as we well know. If you're going to understand the Bible, you need to look at it from the point of view of someone observing it on the earth. And so it does appear that the sun rises, but it doesn't mean that God got it wrong. It just meant that was the way that it appeared to those who wrote the Bible. God doesn't try and give us a science manual in his word. Some more things theistic evolutionists believe. The six days in Genesis 1, they say, are actually six stages of evolution where God introduced new DNA to the earth. Or, as some of them do, they say six stages of revelation to Moses or somebody else, as we'll see later on. They don't always believe it was Moses. They say that God remained detached for four to, between 4 and 14 billion years, and you will find in theistic evolution, some accept 4, some go to 14 billion years before creating Adam and giving him a law. So God didn't have any dealings with the, the, the beings on the earth until the time of Adam. This, is, this one, next, next one is, is, there are plenty of, of postings on this subject. I find this one of the most abominable of all, is that they say, well, the creation today is full of mistakes and deficiencies, um, which indicate that evolution is still happening. Rather than actually accepting that God has cursed the earth, that we are faced with mortality, that we are faced with genetic deficiencies that have come through the sins of men, um, they now say that the fact that there are mistakes and deficiencies in creation indicates that evolution is still happening and therefore very likely to go on for much longer. They believe that science can provide the answers to the origins of the earth and they believe that science and God's words can be reconciled. But to do that, we have to reinterpret the Bible to fit evolution. So bear in mind, what we're dealing with with theistic evolution is not the model in some churches. It's not the model. It's not the Darwinian model of pure chance. What we're dealing with, God-directed evolution, is the same reason, the same purpose, but taking the element of chance out of it. And that's what they have done with their theories of theistic evolution. Again, Brother Jonathan Burke. And I want you to notice the certainty he puts upon his belief in science. We know that the universe is ancient, originating nearly 14 billion years ago in a big bang. Furthermore, we know that the diversity of life we see arose by an evolutionary process. Now, you can only know that by believing scientists. How does this relate to the Bible? Another way to look at this, the Genesis record, is to see a divine hand at work setting the parameters to allow life as we know it to appear. So Genesis 1 is now reduced to a, a, a list of parameters or, or stages, not a factual record of what actually happened. And I think anyone with any Bible knowledge would immediately find that particular confidence in science to be a problem. When you come down to putting theistic evolution in simple terms, it comes down to this. Created means evolved. Six days could be anything of 15 different varieties. Adam was not the first human. Adam was created mortal and prone to sin. Very good, as we understand it, now includes mortal beings. Dying thou shalt die was just a legal sentence. It wasn't a change in the nature of Adam. It was just uh, applying a death sentence to a mortal person. There was no literal serpent, and Moses didn't write Genesis. And that's pretty well some of the, the common things you find amongst these evolutionists, who, by the way, don't always agree amongst themselves. Now, this is different writings from Brother Jonathan Pogson, Brother Jonathan Burke, um, about their views. So Brother Jonathan Pogson first, God actually used evolution totally over billions of years and merely gave us stories about Adam, the serpent, and Cain as allegories or parables to teach moral lessons. So for Brother Jonathan Pogson, Genesis 1 to 11 is all allegories and parables. Brother Jonathan Burke, God used evolution over billions of years, actively adding to the process. There's that assumption again. Then performed a special creation of Adam and gave him the law Adam then passed on the law to the evolved humans, or hominids. So again, you can see that some believe in Adam, some don't. Uh, some believe in, in Cain, some don't. Almost all of them don't believe in a literal serpent. So you'll find amongst the theistic evolutionists that they don't always agree amongst themselves. They're very far from being united about their theories. This is to quote an outside uh, evolutionist. This is Daniel Harlow. Uh, who is a, a noted church authority on this subject. And, and 
it just shows you how you can read the Bible wrongly. What, what this says is Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 are two creation accounts that don't particularly agree. And enthusiastic evolutionists will throw this at you. Paulo said this, Because Genesis has two creation accounts with so many discrepancies, neither of them can be taken to offer factual evidence on creative history. And that's a tremendous leap in, in logic there. Um, number one, that there are discrepancies. And secondly, there's no factual information in Genesis 1 and 2. Well, the answer is very simple. What we have in Genesis 1 is the record of the whole six days' work. And bear in mind that there are no chapter divisions in the Bible, or original Bible. The record then goes on after Genesis chapter 1 to give us the vital detail of what happened on the sixth day of that creation process in regard to the naming of the animals and the man and the woman and some more details about the two trees, etc. So, you know, there's no conflict between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 that actually allows us to say that we can therefore discard the factual evidence that that record presents. That just gives you some idea of how theistic evolutionists think. They look for discrepancies and then say, well, that, that gets rid of the facts. This is Brother Jonathan Pogson, which just shows you where you can end up when you go down this path of saying Genesis is not literal. He says this, and this, is, of course, is a classic case of postmodern rewriting history. We're all familiar with Eden's imagery and devices. A talking snake who beguiles an innocent woman who didn't have a mother. A V formed from a sleeping man's rib, supernatural trees. In other words, it's all too much to believe in such things, isn't it, really? As an allegory, Eden's story is deep, as a literal historical record is weak. It employs highly symbolic and fantastic imagery to convey its message. And you get a very clear idea that you're dealing here with a totally different way of reading the Bible. And that's where we're going to end up today, is how different the Bible can be read. And that's very, very startling when you see it in their own words like that. There are many extremes in the theistic evolution community inside the Brotherhood. Some of them would say that everything in Genesis 1 to 11 is fables and stories that were given by God at the time of the Jews' exile in Babylon because God, they needed something to counter the Babylonian myths of creation that they were subject to in Babylon. And so God gave them a better set of stories than the Babylonians had come up with. Nearly all of them believed there was no literal serpent. It was just a parable for sinful thoughts. Most of them will tell you that Moses did not write the first five books of the Bible. It was a collection of stories for the uneducated Jews at the time of Daniel and Ezra to give them a better story about that. And you will find that when people speak on the, the different myths of history, they will compare the Egyptian record of creation, the Sumerian, they will compare the Babylonian, and then they'll come up and say, well, here's the Jewish one, and this is a much better story, a much better set of myths than those of the ancient world. And that's how they then denigrate the Genesis record down to a myth. As I said, this, this aspect about the creation have many mistakes and deficiency um, is, is what I find one of the most abhorrent all of the views that you hear. Well, you know, when you've seen that sort of evidence, why would it why would intelligent Christadelphians go down this path? Well, today we're faced with a scientific community that's put out so many conclusions in the areas of origins. Uh, people with incredible human wisdom have come up with these theories and written scientific papers of all kinds, which are accepted in the academic world as proven fact, when they ought not to be. Some Christadelphians undertook to try and say, well, we must be able to find the errors in these papers and these conclusions in these scientific studies. Um, but, of course, no one in our community has, has the, the experience or the ability to understand all the different scientific papers and origins out there. They're highly complex, and those who have tried to go and sort them out have found themselves very much bewildered in the process. And, and I would say to people, unless you have the qualifications to deal with the topic, then you're best to leave it alone because you will find it very confusing. But we have some intelligent Christadelphians who've gone down this path and have found that the writings of the scientists are very impressive. And because they want to appear relevant to the world, they try and accommodate the science, but also keeping their views as God being the overall creator. 
One supporter of TE said this, I believe the evidence for evolution is so overwhelming that an honest interpretation of the scriptures must reconcile evolution with what the Bible says. And so to them, the evidence for for scientific view of evolution is overwhelming. So we have to honestly now look at the scriptures again and reinterpret what the Bible says. And that is the, the sad problem of why we have this problem of theistic evolution. Um, again, from the words of a theist, this, this evolutionist within the Brotherhood. Biological evolutionary theory is formulated by Darwin is found to be correct and is therefore clearly a mechanism that God has employed for his own creative purpose. Evolution is a scientific fact and a mechanism which was used by God. And, and you can see how the brethren have actually taken the science as being absolute proven fact and correct and therefore we have to look at the Bible again. So why have we got this problem now? Well, because this respect for the unfounded claims of science. A respect for human qualifications. There are some of these people who debate on these sites who will not even talk to you unless you can actually list your qualifications because they regard you as being unfit for the discussion. Um, there's an inability to unwind or owe the various scientific reasonings that are out there. And, of course, they say, well, look, these scientists have had their, their articles and their conclusions peer-reviewed and there's a consensus view that this is the, the way that we have to accept this and therefore it becomes accepted as fact. And, and, and it's just a sad thing that this concept in the scientific community, that if you've had it peer-reviewed by other scientists, then it actually ends up being fact and can be taught as fact. And if you want to remain relevant, then of course, then you have to somehow find a way to accommodate the Bible to it. So they come up with conclusions like these. Adam was not the first man created, perhaps the first specially created man. When they talk about Adam being the first man, they say he was perhaps the first evolved man that we have a record of, or he was the first man that God dealt with, um, the first specially created man. They have to make first man mean something else. Our statement of faith is very clear that the first man, Adam, was made in a certain way by God, which we say was very good. They say Adam was created mortal. He was already a dying creature before God began to deal with him. They do not accept that mortality and sin came into the world because of transgression. There were other evolved mortals, hominids, roaming around the earth before Adam. They say that Adam's mortality, his deathfulness, his sentence of death, resulted in being excluded from the tree of life, and he lost his hope of becoming immortal. So it was for Adam's uh, a case, a, an, almost an eternal condemnation because of his sin. It was only a legal condemnation because nothing had to change in his nature. He was just allowed to go through the process of mortality because mortality had been around for millions of years. And so you can see these conclusions are quite different to the way we have normally interpreted Genesis. Some of the implications of accepting theistic evolution are these. You have to accept that for perhaps 14 or 14 billion years, God didn't deal with anybody. And then for the last 150 million years where there were various stages of evolved beings upon the earth, that God gave them no hope, no reason for their existence. He just allowed them to live and die for 150 million years and with no purpose or reason to do so until Adam comes along and God starts now to make his purpose known. This one about creation being flawed and therefore is still evolving is, is a terrible way to try and prove theistic evolution. Um, in our educated scientific world, we do not have to stay with the simple Bible stories as facts. So this is a, a thing that they, they accept that, you know, the Bible stories, the Bible myths, the Bible's parables are not really facts about creation and origins. And it introduces this whole new pattern of reading the Bible. We can change God's clear statements. So when they come to Exodus 20, verse 11, which says that God made the heavens and the earth in six days, they say, well, that's a scribal insertion, that, and they put up a whole theological case about many verses which they don't particularly like because they express, express clear truths about what God would have us to know. So there are many implications when you go down this path of theistic evolution, and perhaps the, the most serious of all is the way that people begin to read the Bible differently. I want to talk about two methods that they employ. When you engage in the initial discussion with these people, the first statement or the first question you get is, do you believe that we as Christadelphians should prove all things? And of course, any Christadelphian would say, yes, we have to prove all things. 
Well, they say, I'm going to send you a mountain of scientific papers that prove evolution is true. Um, when you've actually worked out where they might be wrong, then you can get back to me. And so, you know, they, they oblige you then to try and get involved in sorting out the science and all the conclusions of the scientists. The implication being, if you can't defeat the scientists and their arguments, then science must be right about how life began. And therefore, you must therefore reinterpret the Bible. So that's one method they employ. So must we prove the science wrong? Well, no. The Bible is about teaching the truth of God. It enables us to fight error on the, on the doctrines of God. And we do test all doctrines against the Bible. It says in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and the testimony, if they agree not with these, then there is no light in them. What the Bible does, it states God's view of the facts about the origin of life. And we are not required to, uh, to undo all the complicated arguments of the scientists and the theories of men. On the other hand, there are many scientists, many eminent scientists who believe in creation, as the Bible describes it, and align their scientific views with it. Or at least they believe an intelligent design was involved because no rational scientist can say that this happened by pure chance. So there are plenty of scientists out there who will argue with the scientists and actually come up with a very convincing case that science does actually support the Bible. But to us, the, the, the average Christadelphian, we do not have to go and understand all the complicated scientific theories of men. We don't fear facts, but we do reject speculation on origins which are ruthlessly and dishonestly marketed as facts. And that's the problem we have, is that the world has accepted this is proven fact, when it's nothing more than theory, which is constantly changing itself as evidence is coming up all the time. When you go to the Bible, there is not even one verse that suggests anything like the gradualism that TE requires. You go to the Psalms, it says in Psalm 33, verse 6 to 8, by the, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, he spake and it was done. And we have this concept of instant miracles at the hand of God in the origin of this earth. And, and it's really amazing, isn't it, that we do not have to prove the science wrong. We just need to believe in what God said and stay with that. So let's talk now about the way the Bible is written, because this is the most critical part of theistic evolution. When we come to the Bible, we must let the Bible teach us. We must come to the Bible and say, what is God saying to us? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you come to the Bible with a, a pre-existing set of, of, of firm ideas in your head, looking for evidence to support that, you can find evidence on the surface to support any notion you like. Trinitarians can, can stay with, with John chapter 1 and say, look, the Trinity is quite clearly expressed to me there. If you want to believe in the devil and demons, you will find plenty of evidence on the surface to believe in devil and demons. The Mormons can believe in baptism of the dead just from one verse. And, and many other topics, of course, can be reinforced if that's an idea that you have already formed and you're unwilling to look at the evidence against it. So the Bible, as we know, is not written to be absolutely and clear. It requires seeking, it requires knocking, it requires searching, it requires digging. It's the honour of God to conceal matters, and we have to search them out and compare Scripture with Scripture that we might come to the truth of these matters. And, you know, the Bible says if you come to the, to the, and approach the Word of God with an absolutely fixed mindset against the, the doctrines of God, then God will send you further delusions. And, and that's what's happened, of course, with most of the mainstream churches. When it comes to theistic evolution, because they come to the Bible saying that science is a proven fact, then they have to start reasoning away simple Bible passages. So that's that's one of the, the things that we're going to talk about is the need to read the Bible correctly. The second tactic I want to mention that the theistic evolution will use on you is that they will say to you, well, there are two books of, of explaining the origins of life. And, and both Darwin and Francis Bacon, philosopher of, of, of that time, put up the idea that there were parallel books of revelation about the origins of life. Um, and theistic evolutionists also believe this is a concept that they will accept. There's the Bible and there's the book of nature, which they call the book of his works. And what we find, of course, that the scientists will only go to the book of nature and interpret it as they see it to speculate on the origins of life. 
Um, if you want to have both books, then you have to reinterpret the Bible to agree with the science because the scientists will not include the Bible in their discussions at all. So this is what Francis Bacon said. There are two books of Revelation, the natural world and the Bible, equally relevant. Quoting Francis Bacon, God has in fact written two books, not just one. Of course, we're all familiar with the first book he wrote, namely Scripture. But he's written a second book called Creation. And this concept that we accept another book is the one of the fundamental problems we have when it comes to our love of the Scriptures. Because we now have to look at creation as science understands it. And that is where the problem comes in. For the Jonathan Burke, you'll notice right down the bottom, he's, really, he's happy to be quoted on these matters. I have asserted that God does not describe an evolutionary process in Genesis 1-3. to So he can see that you cannot fit evolution into that. But he does describe an evolutionary process in the book of his works, The Natural Creation. So there again, we have another book that we now look at, and which one is the more authoritative? Well, Genesis contains a description of literal historical events, but does not describe all of God's creative activity. So... The evolution part is not there in Genesis. You have to go outside the Bible to find out what happened with the origins of the earth. I've made it clear that I do not believe in a literal six-day creation since at least 2009. You can quote me writing it yet again. So I'm very happy to quote him yet again because it gives you a clear picture of where they're coming from with their belief in an evolutionary process. So this evolution says that God's words and works uh, and, of course, bear in mind that the book of science constantly upgrades itself and changes as they find new evidence, or they have to rewrite the whole thing because what they find doesn't fit with the existing theory. But they say it must be harmonised. And, and we say that God's word and science will never completely harmonise because the science has a number of problems with it. It's guesswork. It's naturalistic. In other words, they will not allow God one foot in the door they assume 14 billion years of uniform condition so that all their dating methods depend upon that uniformity. And there's supposition based on assumption, based on hope that one day they will find the evidence of the missing links that they haven't yet found. And so this whole theory of evolution is, is, is so wrong when it comes to the fact that it's nothing to do with fact. It is still very much unsupported, unproven, unscientific theory. And we've got to keep saying that because... The modern world keeps saying it's proven fact. If we have the worldwide flood that the Bible talks about, then all the, all the assumptions about dating of rocks and the age of things and the age of fossils becomes completely obsolete uh, because when you have tremendous upthrust of magnetic forces of perhaps a great volcanic activity, tremendous movements of water, tsunamis, great breaking up of the Earth's crust of the Earth, the Bible describes then... All of those dating methods become incredibly subject to change. So we need to move into making sure that we follow the Bible and not the guesswork of science. Unlike rocks and fossils, the Bible does give clear propositions and descriptions of the past, and it actually involves God performing miracles. And, and it's... It's very sad when we have to go back to God having to use evolution rather than showing his power in the things that are created instantly. So we must read the Bible very differently to the book of nature. What we should do is read what the Bible says and then say, well, the book of nature only supports the, the wonder and the power and, the, and the, the wisdom of the creator, but it doesn't support the scientific conclusions that are being made by men in the world today. Why does it matter? Well, let's just talk about how this impacts upon the brotherhood. Accepting theistic evolution does impact upon many clear Bible teachings, especially upon the Genesis record and the unique understanding of the atonement we have. And, and they will point out to you that, you know, that the matter of origins is not in the BASF and therefore um, it's not an essential doctrine. And we would we'd say, well, that's, that's, that's absolutely correct. However, when it comes to the atonement, was Adam the first man? Was Adam created mortal or very good? Was there a literal serpent in the garden? Did proneness to sin come as a result of transgression or not? And, and, and because they say, well, look, these are only myths or stories, not literal events, 
They find themselves in conflict with both Jesus and Paul, who used the Genesis history to teach divine principles. And Jesus could say, what did Moses write? He could say, in the beginning it was not so. Paul could quote the fall and what happened in the fall as the basis of some of his teachings in the first of Timothy chapter 2. So to, to Jesus and Paul, these were events you could rely upon. This is something that actually happened. But when you make them into myths, then you're taking away the power of those arguments. You reduce them down to parables and stories, not literal events. So it is important that we don't allow the Bible to be reinterpreted to fit the claims of science. And, and, and therefore, we actually end up tying God to whatever scientific explanation is current. And then they do change quite um, dramatically over time. And this is a very dangerous way to actually make the Bible follow in the, in the footsteps of science. So, again, just some of the things, if you believe this evolution, these are some of the things that you will end up following. Billions of years, not six days. No 7,000-year plan. Genesis being just moral stories given for ignorant Jews. Millions of people dying without hope and purpose for Adam. Adam not being the first human. God acting remotely for billions of years. You know, one of the things that in discussions with somebody came out was, well, look, if God took billions of years to get to this point, maybe there's billions of years of evolution yet to go. And it puts off the, the, the kingdom into the vast distance. Believing Adam was mortal before he sinned is always there to err on the atonement. And, and there's so much history in the Brotherhood about people who say that Adam was mortal and that there was no physical change, that there was no proneness to sin that came as a result of transgression. It's gone down many paths in the brotherhood which have always led to error on the atonement. So this is an important issue. It's not something we can ignore. The Bible clearly says this. The Bible was created in six days. Why does the Bible talk about evening mornings in Genesis chapter 1? Because that's what God wanted you to understand. It was a 24-hour period that that part of creation was done. <clears throat> now we know how much dependent creation is upon itself to have certain parts in place to support other parts. But God created a world in six days that witnessed his glory and character. God uses instant miracles, his word to create, his power to create things instantly. And, and it's it's so clear, isn't it, that that's what the Bible says happened. And, and T.E., when you push them, have to admit that their understanding is not taught in the Bible. So they go about reinterpreting the Bible. We're told to guard the deposit. You know, we've been given this, this one saving truth, which makes us the first fruits under God. It makes us the bride of Christ. It's a precious deposit. We have to guard. It means there has to be some action because some have swerved from the faith in, in bringing in new ideas from what is falsely called knowledge. You know, out there in the world is this, this so-called scientific knowledge is taken as absolute fact, and yet it's anything but. Now, in the first century, those who professed this higher knowledge were the Gnostics, the knowing ones who became the Nicolaitans. Brother Thomas said this about the Nicolaitans in Eureka, Volume 1. They professed knowledge, gnosis, or false science, which was subversive of the truth. The same thing is styled in our day, theological science, ethics, hermeneutics, and that's a word that the theist evolutionists love. Terms invented to amaze the ignorant and to impress them with the need for schools and colleges of indoctrination. And, and, you know, we find that some of these people are actually going to theological college to get information that is then used to undermine the, the writings of Moses and the writings of the scriptures. So, you know, this idea of people having a higher intellect and being able to understand concepts that the ordinary people can't is something that we're dealing with in the brotherhood. And they set to work to elaborate a theology that would make Christianity respectable, acceptable to the learned world. And that's something Brother Thomas wrote over 150 years ago. You know, error is not new. Nothing new under the sun. This is Gibbon talking about in his day. The Mosaic account of the creation and fall of man was treated with profane derision by the Gnostics, who would not listen to the day of rest after six days of labour, to the rib of Adam, to the Garden of Eden, the trees of life of knowledge, and the speaking serpent, and the condemnation pronounced against humankind. And that's almost exactly what, what we saw before from Brother Jonathan Pogson. They will not listen to what the Genesis record says about these things. Acknowledging that the literal sense is repugnant to every principle of faith as well as reason, they deem themselves secure and invulnerable behind an ample veil of allegory, 
over all of Moses' words. And that was something that happened to the brotherhood in the early centuries after Christ. And it's happening again today. So God has chosen us. This is coming back to our reading. You know, sometimes when you get involved in this debate, you're intimidated by the incredible amount of scientific information they can dump on you. And, and at some stages, I was receiving huge volumes of scientific papers, which I was challenged to unpick. And, and it's intimidating when that happens to you. But we're not required because we know something that, that the scientists don't know is that God intends to humiliate the scientists of this world who count themselves as incredibly wise. And God has chosen ordinary, simple folk right down through the centuries. Even today, God is, is working mightily in other places in the world where people are not highly educated because he's going to use those people to confound the mighty of this world. And, and in, the, in the end, no flesh will glory in God's presence, and certainly not scientists will come to God and say, well, we worked you out, uh, and other people couldn't. The day is coming, the Bible says, when the wisdom of this world is going to be humiliated. And people will come and they will say, our fathers inherited nothing but lies, worthless things which there was no profit. And one of the things at the head of those lies will be Darwinism. That was some of the lies that were propagated in the world, which people would, in the kingdom will say, we were completely misled. And the veil that is spread over all nations will be removed in the kingdom. So don't be intimidated by the vast amount of scientific information that some of these people will present to you. Stay with what the scriptures say, because the scriptures are very clear on what God wants us to believe. So the simple question is, who do you believe? It comes down to a question of authority. <clears throat> Evolutionists appeal to the consensus authority. The National Academy of Science says, while the mechanisms of evolution are still under investigation, now there's an admission, isn't it? They don't take us as proven fact. Scientists universally accept that the cosmos, our planet, and life evolved and continue to evolve. So you see, science depends upon this consensus that they all agree with each other. And of course, as you know, that if, you, if you're in academia and you actually start talking about creation as God describes it, you'll soon lose your job. So... You know, they actually have this pressure to people to accept the consensus. But we are believers in the Bible. We have an authority, which is the word of God, which is proven and reliable. So the matter is quite simple. Either we believe what God has said, or we go and we listen to the reasonings of the serpents of this age, which is to say that God didn't really mean what he said, um, and we've got a better idea, which is what happened in the Garden of Eden in the very first place. Now, we might be thought that we are simple fools, that we don't accept the science, that we don't really want to know about the science. Well, it says there in Corinthians, we should be happy to be thought fools for Christ's sake. In the very learned Athenian world, which Paul moved into, they thought that Paul was foolish for talking about the resurrection and talking about Christ, a, a son of God that actually got himself killed. They didn't accept that as being what they would like. Well, our gospel might be thought to be foolish in the eyes of this world, but not foolish in the eyes of God. And we accept God at, at his word. So what should Ecclesiastes do? Well, education on simple Bible teachings is, is required. To unpick the places where the theist evolutionists do actually misquote the Bible is essential. To give answers like what happened to Cain when he, he was exiled needs to be given, and it can be given very simply. Unfortunately, a lot of these people, because they work on the internet or are in ecclesias that don't regard this matter as particularly important, most of them can't be actually reached by any ecclesial discipline. But we have to remember in our dealings with them to remain Christ-like in whatever we do. And, and you will find in these furious debates that happen on the internet that quite often they become incredibly personal, incredibly vicious, and, and it requires of us as those who are trying to bring rescue people from the error that we make sure we deal with them always in a brotherly way, despite the fact that they will sometimes become very difficult. Though we're very aggressive, they, they, can, they know that they can go outside the normal realms of the brotherhood. They don't get printed in the magazine, so they actually have this online focus and they can get to many young people by that method. They will devalue the BASF as a man-made document, and this is something which is happening in the wider circles of the brotherhood now, that... This idea of man-made documents is being raised. Um, it needs revision, and they, of course, come up with their own statements of faith, which really don't address any of these issues. 
So watch out for new statements of faith that are coming at us from many directions. Um, I believe that they should not be received as visitors in our ecclesias unless they reject the views they have openly proclaimed. That doesn't mean that people who are trying to sort it out shouldn't be given time. What it means is that those who have published, those who have clearly stated their views and not repented of them, um, they have views which they openly admit cannot fit the BASF or the Cooper Carter Addendum in Australia, and therefore it's an amazement to me that they are still received by some ecclesias. The ecclesias who receive them will actually say that Brother Roberts talked about uncertain details. And when you read Brother Roberts' article on, cert on uncertain details, you will find that he dealt with matters that were matters of speculation, interpretations of prophecy, or matters like, you know, is he not still alive, things like that, which are certainly not doctrinal issues. When it comes to the atonement, when it comes to Adam being the first man, was Adam mortal before he sinned? These are matters that impact upon our clear statement of faith. They are not uncertain details. I want to just quote to you the conclusions of the Watford Arranging Brethren who dealt with Brother Ralph Lovelock in 1962 to 1964. Being very generous brethren, including Brother Neville, uh, Brother Harry Tennant, uh, Brother Smart, who wrote the book on James, you know, their Arranging Brethren took over two years to actually deal with Brother Ralph's views in a very, very brotherly fashion. And, and even though they were criticised for, for not moving quicker, Nevertheless, in the end, the Watford Arranging Brethren came down very strongly on the side of the Bible against the views of evolution. But I want you to notice that the experience in which they tried to unpick the science, tried to unpick the reasonings that were based upon science, they said have been spiritually barren for all of us Arranging Brethren. And, and we would not wish others to be forced with the same experience. And I would say to you, if you're not qualified, do not try and unpick the science. One or two of us who followed out the consideration of Ralph's views with deep personal involvement have experienced all the threats of agnosticism and destruction of faith, which have made us certain that the two views cannot exist side by side in their own minds. So that was their conclusion, that these two views, creation and evolution, cannot exist inside the brotherhood in their minds. Going on with their writing, and you want to read the whole document, it's, it's quite a wonderful document. In particular, we have felt that to accept the kind of approach to scriptural interpretation that is involved in Ralph's exposition would be to leave ourselves at the mercy of any other passing wind of doctrine that drew its sanction from a theoretically possible but otherwise unnatural meaning imposed upon a passage of scripture. And that, brethren and sisters and young people, is the great problem with his devolution. It imposes unnatural readings upon the scripture. That's the whole problem. It approaches inspiration in a different way. That some verses are inspired and some are not. That you can interpret verses as you want to interpret them because you accept that science is right. And that is, is the problem with theistic evolution inside the brotherhood. And so this was their final conclusion. Having reached this decision, we were led to contemplate the fourth course of action referred to above to recommend to the ecclesia that failing some significant modification in Ralph's views, we reluctantly and sorrowfully withdraw our fellowship from him. They didn't want to do that. But in the end, they found that it was impossible to do otherwise. And, and there was the danger of these views inside the Brotherhood affecting other people. So I'd recommend if you haven't read the Watford Statement that you do so because it was put together after tremendously deep and long consideration of the issues involved with theistic evolution back in the 1960s. We are warned against error and, and we need to be vigilant. As we said at the start, we have to be vigilant to defend the faith once delivered for all time to the saints. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions, and they are causing divisions in Australia here already and overseas. They create obstacles. Contrary to the doctrine you have been taught, avoid them. They do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, their own appetites, their own uh, promotion in these things. Smooth talk at Federer, they deceive the hearts of the naive, and of course, they actually are very good in encouraging people to go down the paths of believing theistic evolution. So beware of these people and, and be wise what is good and innocent of what is evil. Colossians 1 verse 23. It's not a time for us to change our views on the origins of life. Continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. Remember, it was the gospel of truth. It's been proclaimed in all creation under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. 
And, you know, if, if we think now that we have to reinterpret the Bible, then we're also saying that God has left all past generations in ignorance or misled. And that would be very untrue of our God. I want to just conclude with this verse from the end of the Bible where Revelation was now finished, where the, the unfolding of the mind of God was now finished in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus finishes his last opportunity to speak to the ecclesias of the world. He finishes with, with two particular warnings. One, he says there are people who will take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. There are people who will add. Now, <clears throat> we're not the people who add. The people who add are the Mormons who have two books, the Book of Mormon alongside the Bible, the Jehovah Witnesses who have 12 apostles. You have the Pentecostals who have spirit-guided apostles who bring in new revelations. We are not those who add because those who add get all the plagues written in this book. Our warning is the second one. This warning is to people who are already have their names in the Book of Life. You notice how different is the punishment between these two warnings. If any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. And that's his saying very clearly, brethren and sisters, that when people say that verses are not inspired, when they say that these are scribal insertions, when they say that Moses did not write the books that he claims to write, when they say that Jesus and Paul were just quoting myths and parables to prove principles, they are taking away from the words of, the, of God in this book. And this is those inside the brotherhood who are in the book of life that are warned against doing this. So I leave you with that final exhortation from the Lord Jesus Christ himself that this is not a matter of opinion. This is not a matter of speculation. This is not a matter of uncertain details. We are dealing with a whole new approach to how the Bible is going to be read. And that's why we need to stand fast in the things that we have believed and have been assured of. And then we must vigorously defend that faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. Thank you.